Coming up this week on Ignition GT, we spend some time in the ultra-luxurious Lexus LS500. For your comfort, the seats are 22-way adjustable, indicative of what the LS500 is all about. The refreshed Mini Cooper takes a bow. Only the entry-level Mini 1 gets a new power plant, a 1.5 replacing the old 1.2. And we give you the lowdown on special edition models. A special edition uh, predominantly focuses around one, uh, exclusivity, um, but also in terms of a value proposition. You're watching Ignition GT. Hello and welcome to this week's show. 2018 seems to be a good year for birthdays and anniversaries, but one that holds special significance for South Africans is that of the Volkswagen Golf. While the Mark I, as it was retrospectively named, was launched in Europe in 1974, it took another four years for production to kick off here. The rest, as they say, is history, with more than 800,000 Mark I's being built at VW's Utenegg plant up to the end of production in 2008. But back to the present day and time to sample something more sophisticated from Lexus. If you want five-star treatment, personalized service, and the ultimate in luxury, you come to a place like this. Which is why it was fitting that Lexus chose Fairlawn's boutique hotel and spa as the venue for the rather exclusive launch of their new LS500 limousine. Now, unfortunately, I didn't crack the nod for that launch, but because I know people who know people who know people, I did get to experience the spoils. And it's exactly that kind of person who'll be able to drop over two million bucks on this Lexus. Someone who's very connected, who likes to be connected, and who likes being spoiled. Check this out. So the Lexus LS has an all-new multi-information touchpad. Much like other Lexi, it is very sensitive to the touch, which is makes it even harder when you're working with your left hand but there are loads and loads and loads of menus to go through lots of different setups lots of tech there to keep you entertained also for the driver there's an all-new heads-up display it's color and it's apparently the largest in class more cleverly though and importantly for the driver is that it has a visual range of three meters ahead to minimize the focus change while you're driving for your comfort the seats are 22-way adjustable indicative of what the LS500 is all about, something the Japanese call omotenashi. It's quite difficult to explain, but revolves around the art of hospitality and creating an inviting atmosphere. Lexus has certainly managed to do that. Let me show you. For a start, you've got these 17-inch screens in the rear, controlled by your own little massive remote control over here. The armrests of the chair are incorporated, but also floating away from the door. It's supposed to feel like your own cozy armchair back home, which I suppose is a good thing, because a lot of Lexus LS owners might spend more time in the back. There are 16 different sensing areas around the car for temperature to make sure each and every passenger is completely comfortable. While we're talking numbers, 23 speakers on the Mark Levinson sound system to make sure Beethoven sounds just fantastic. And we haven't even got to the lighting yet, apparently inspired by Japanese lanterns. It all combines to create a truly sumptuous space. And Lexus tells us that's what the LS is all about. Luxury as an experience, rather than something you own or possess. Of course, the finer things in life are always about personalization. And Lexus certainly hasn't missed the boat on that one. Here you have Carico cut glass, exquisite, the door trim, hand pleated using a painstaking technique and offset by the handcrafted wood veneer. Outside the signature spindle grill features 5,000 different surfaces to make up the individual grill facets. While striking the LS face is but one part of the aesthetics that make up this fifth generation model. For a start, the silhouette is much more coupe-like, without compromising interior space at all. In fact, passengers in the back get 86 millimeters more legroom than that found in the previous model. That's also thanks to the fact that the LS makes use of Lexus's new global luxury platform, which we first saw on the LC500. It offers a lower center of gravity with a 15 millimeter lower driving position than the outgoing LS500, although air suspension means you're able to tailor the height for getting in and out of the car. 
The LS500 is of course very well engineered. The adaptable variable suspension, which uses G-forces, yaw rate and speed sensors, will give you the best control possible in dynamic situations. There's also an all-new VDIM, or Vehicle Dynamics Integrated Management System, which incorporates eight different factors to deliver great balance behind the wheel. The LS rides on 20-inch noise-reducing tyres, and they work really, really well. OK, I know it's not just the tyres, but man, it is quiet in here. And that's a good thing, because the sound you really want to hear is that. It's a three and a half litre V6 twin turbo lurking under the bonnet. Now this is the first time Lexus has given us a twin turbo to enjoy, and it has been well worth the wait. Mind you, it does need all of its 310 kilowatts and 600 newton meters to pull its two and a half ton weight through all four driven wheels. But it does it well. Just look at that 0 to 100 time. This all-new engine was specially developed for the LS, and while there is only the 500 to enjoy for now, you can look forward to an F-Sport model joining the range later this year, and a hybrid in 2019. Why you'd want an F-Sport, I don't really know, because this is hardly a car for robot-to-robot -robot dashes. Rather, you'll be letting your 10-speed transmission glide through the ratios while you waft along to catch that charter flight to the Seychelles, or indeed, for a weekend away at Fairlands. Yes, you do need to be rather well endowed in the wallet area to buy this car. At 2.1 million rand, it is in line price-wise with super limos like the BMW 750Li and the Merc S560L. There's also the Jaguar XJ, and who can leave out the most popular SA car of the year winner ever, the Porsche Panamera, which actually for similar performance does come in slightly under the 2 million rand mark, although that's potentially a different type of buyer altogether. Much like luxurious boutique hotels like Fairlawns have become de rigueur, clearly there is a market in South Africa for cars like this, otherwise there wouldn't be so much to choose from. But what do you choose? I think ultimately at this level it boils down to brand and which one has the better snob value. Me? Well, as it would happen, this particular LS appears to have my name on it. Stay tuned because after the break we look at the week's automotive newsmakers. Every surface of this special KB is decked out in gleaming sable, amusingly named Black Meat Kettle. And later on in the show we find out how manufacturers make sure they satisfy consumer needs. Consumers are very much informed as you can imagine. So important for us to kind of have our finger on the pulse to know what customers are looking for. And welcome back to Ignition GT. This week we kick off our roundup of local and international news with a look at one of the biggest transport events in South Africa and one that has very little to do with cars. Road transport is very important not only to South Africa but the rest of Africa and, and uh, you know a lot of countries are landlocked and dependent on road transport very much for road transport. It being such a huge industry, it didn't really have its own mouthpiece before. So we've created TruckX, which started about five years ago as a conference, and it's evolved now into an exhibition and a conference. So it's, a, it's an opportunity for the whole of the road transport industry to come together uh, through exhibits, through demonstrations, through product launches. Uh, we have competitions on the dynamic handling track here at Kailami. We've got a Chinese exhibitor here who is, is bringing product into the country which spare parts people could then take on and sell into this, into this market. It's suppliers with batteries, tyres, all that type of thing, uh, original equipment, manufacturers. It's just, it's the whole trucking industry from, from A to Z, that's what it is. What really stood out at this year's expo was the number of technological advances aimed at improving safety. Highlights included sensors that are mounted inside the tyres and which transmit information on tyre pressure and temperature to the driver via Bluetooth, as well as dash cams that employ face recognition technology to detect if a driver is sleeping behind the wheel or using a cell phone. I mean, you think of, of how much a truck costs these days, and if it's off the road, 
through an accident or through some damage to a mechanical failure because they've used, you know, missed the drivers misused it, um, then it costs the company money. So the more preventive measures they can take, the better it is and more profitable they become. Apart from the fact it's a lot safer for everybody else on the road. This week, the Ignition team got to sample the latest addition to Isuzu's long line of X-Rider models, and no prizes for guessing what it's called. Every surface of this special KB is decked out in gleaming sable, amusingly named Black Meat Kettle. That's the extent of its cuteness, for this is one purposeful looking bucky. The 18-inch alloys are color-coded too, as are the side steps, sports bar and grill. There is a generous sprinkling of X-Rider logos, some might say too generous, and inside you will find and piano black inserts adorning the dash and door panels. If you are expecting additional standard equipment or comfort features, you'll be disappointed. The KBE remains one of the top selling pickups in the land, but it really is getting on a bit. And no, we're not just talking about the absence of a touchscreen and Apple CarPlay. There's a certain clunkiness about the controls and in the way it drives, which reminds you of what Bucky's were like 10 years ago. The engine is noisy, the gear change notchy, and the ride bouncy. Some people might find these nostalgic dynamics endearing, but it's unlikely to appeal to anyone who's driven an Amarok or a Ranger. What do we think? Well, starting from 426,000 Rand for the 4x2 version, the Black Edition offers good value for money, and it comes with a contemporary 5-year 90,000 km service plan. But in all honesty, if you're in the mood for a blast from the past, buy yourself a proper classic. Speaking of nostalgia, BMW recently introduced a range of upgrades to the world's favorite retro car. Most of the so-called upgrades change the way the Mini looks rather than the way it does things. For instance, all derivatives now come with full LED lights with the tail lamps featuring a Union Jack-inspired design, just in case you didn't know where the car was built. You could argue that the original new Mini started the current wave of personalization and this refreshed model takes it to new heights. Everything including the paddle lamps can be personalized, and before you scoff at the naffness of it all, remember that the Jaguar E-Pace lights up possible obstacles with a Jaguar mum and her cub. Only the entry-level Mini 1 gets a new power plant, a 1.5 replacing the old 1.2, but all automatic derivatives now come with a 7-speed transmission. The latter is a great example of the Mini's ever-increasing sophistication. But fear not, as grown up as it may be, the essential mini driving experience remains intact. It still hugs the corners like a roller coaster, and providing you go for one of the S variants, it will gobble up the straights too. Compared to more conventional rivals like VW's Golf, the Mini's starting price of 302,000 Rand seems competitive. But remember, that Mini won't look, sound or go like this one. And it certainly won't say, hello Lindsay, in puddles. If you want to stay abreast of all the latest automotive news, then you need to keep tuning in to Ignition GT or follow us on any of our social media platforms. Remember, you can also watch any of your favorite reviews again on the Ignition Live YouTube channel. Stay tuned because after the break, we take a closer look at special derivatives of Renault's Quid and Stepway models. <laughs> Renault have had two chart-topping sales success stories with their Sandero and their Quid. And now they've brought two new derivatives, special additions to the market. The Sandero Stepway Plus is now the top offering, replacing the Dynamique. And all that that's done is literally given you, the consumer, a few more added extras, comfort features, to make it even better spec and better bang for your buck. The Quid Climber, on the other hand, is truly a special edition model. Only 200 of them are being produced, and it does sit at the top end of the price point now, 148,000 Rand for it. Now, it got us to thinking about special editions and limited editions. They've been around forever. Now, usually these special models are brought out pretty much towards the end of a life cycle of a model to bolster sales or to generate some new interest in the vehicles. Now a company that has done this particularly well is Toyota with their Dakar spec of the super popular Hilux Bucky. 
The latest iteration of this coveted Hilux model was introduced to celebrate Toyota's second and third podium spots in the 2018 Dakar Rally. Aside from the redesigned trapezoidal grille, the lower bump also features a large honeycomb mesh pattern that extends to the sides of the vehicle, as well as a metallic grey skid plate. At the rear, the bump is also fashioned in grey to tie in with the front end design. But for some brands, it's a case of why wait? They actually launch special edition models when they launch a new model. In fact, in the case of the sixth generation M5, BMW announced that it would be building a limited run of 400 first edition versions before the standard car had even been launched. Finished in frozen dark red metallic with glossy black accents, there is no mistaking one of these Autobahn Stormers for one of its more prolific brethren. BMW also wanted the gaming community to experience its new first edition, which is why they offered it to the folks at Electronic Arts to be featured in the latest installment in the Need for Speed franchise. Renault is no stranger to special editions, having launched the Capture Sunset, the Kajar XP and the Quid Extreme in the last two years. So what is their reasoning? A special edition uh, predominantly focuses around one, uh, exclusivity, um, but also in terms of a value proposition, increasing the value offer of a particular model. I think the main important reason is to keep the product range fresh, uh, we will get a offering from France, uh, whether it's a global limited edition or special edition or a, a local solution for that matter. Um, in conjunction with our after sales department in terms of parts, uh, we can identify opportunities based around equipment, based around styling, based around design, but that focuses on the design, comfort and convenience, uh, uh, increased offer around those factors. Of course, the marketing folk will tell you that manufacturers offer products to fulfill consumer requirements, but what do South African car buyers want? Is that important that a car comes standard with the stuff, or would you prefer to choose what you want in your car? Uh, important that it comes standard. Manufacturers they must give us the choice to choose from the basic car and the car that's got extras already from the factory. Well, it depends on what extras. Because usually when they sell you their car, they they sell you, they put a picture of all the extras in there. So I want to buy the image on the picture. And <laughs> but I think uh, the extras that I would spend would more go on how the car actually looks as opposed to the functionality of those options. Well, the people have spoken and what they want are special equipment packages, which helps to explain why all 200 climbers have already been sold. In fact, so popular are these limited edition models that some dealerships have started creating their own. Now, what I've noticed, you've gone and taken an AMT quid and you've gone and put on slightly fatter tackies, you've put some rails on the top, you've put the chrome detailing in. Mm. That's something that you guys have done yourself. Do you find that helps? I mean, the quid buyer, new to the car market, might not know about optional extras and ticking all the boxes. Is it better for you to show him a product and he goes, oh, I'll take that? Mm. No, definitely. I mean, what you see is what you like. Eh? So if, you, if you're not showing it, the customer is not going to see it. So we have done it, it's on show on the floor as you can see. And uh, yeah, the customers like it like as it is. So yes, there is obviously an added cost to it, but I mean, it's not that much. I think mean, with the mags, the roofs and everything, it's like only five grand extra. Yeah. So I mean, it's worth it. In the case of special editions, there seems to be very little variation in public opinion, but we were curious to find out if the nation is that unanimous in all motoring decisions. If you're gonna buy a car, do you buy a new or a used car? New, definitely new. Used depending on kilometers. I prefer used, Why? just simply because of the value that you get out of a used car. Petrol or diesel? Diesel. Doesn't really matter, but I've never had a diesel car, I always have petrol. When you buy a car, is it a manual or is it automatic? I like a uh, big cars, I like manual. Manual, yes. you like to drive? Yeah, I like to drive. For you? Manual. Manual as well? Yeah. I like manual, uh, but automatic is good. I mean, we in the city, so yeah. automatic is definitely better. Well, with so many differing needs and preferences, how do you go about deciding what models to offer? One is the, a global uh, new car buyer survey, which is an annual report that gets uh, distributed worldwide for us. Um, there we go up against our competitors as well, so we can see exactly what's important for these customers who bought or intend uh, buying. 
We also do digital surveys, uh, online surveys, where it's questionnaires, literally uh, uh, um, asking customers what are the key criteria when purchasing. Um, we do uh, consult with our dealers quite intensively as well. Uh, very close uh, ties within the network. Uh, you know, they were the customers every day, facing the customers, and we get a lot of feedback from that. But what's helped me a lot was having that first-hand experience with customers. That's all very well, but not even the most established brands can offer a vehicle to suit every buyer. So what do you do when your favorite brand doesn't have the car of your dreams? I'm sick into any brand that will give, you, uh, give me value for my money. Yeah. I would stay with BMW. Also with brands, I take into consideration hijacking stats. Yeah. So um, I tend to go for Renaults because they give you quite a lot of bang for your buck and also no one seems to want to hijack them. So one thing is certain, catering to the diverse needs of South African motorists is no easy task. And while buyers become increasingly discerning, manufacturers remain under pressure to make profits in a challenging economic environment. We're seeing that consumers are very much informed, as you can imagine. Um, they do intensive homework. So important for us to kind of have our finger on the pulse to know what customers are looking for. I think there's a lot of options, there's a lot of competition out there and I think all brands are evolving and are being more mindful and thoughtful. So it's just a matter of like, what do you really want? And all too soon, we've come to the end of another episode. Be sure to tune in next week again when Marius gets behind the wheel of BMW's jaw-dropping i8 ragtop. We'll be bringing you the latest automotive news and all the lowdown on recently launched models. And the shootout team evaluate four high-performance SUVs for those with very deep pockets. We'll see you again next time, but until then, please keep it safe on the road.